Good evening. It's good to see all of you here. I'm so glad that you are here for Palm Sunday. I'm <laughs> Palm Sunday. <laughs> That's what this week has been like for me, y'all. It's just been busy, 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 busy. But we've had a, we've had a, a great week, and I am glad that you are here for Monday Thursday communion. Now, as a part of this welcome, I just want to explain some of the things that maybe uh, you've seen or haven't seen before that are part of the Monday Thursday uh, communion service. Some some people put their their Monday Thursday service and their Tenebrae service together. I think College Place Rob told me is doing that tonight. Uh, Tenebrae is very typically a Good Friday service and we'll have our Tenebrae service here tomorrow night at Good Friday and we'll remove all of these implements of worship and extinguish the candles that are on the candelabra uh, representing seven stations on the way to the cross. It's kind of a, analogous to the Via Dolorosa and uh, we have the, the baptismal font very present in worship on Monday Thursday because um, through baptism, we, we come into spiritual knowledge of the Lord, and, and unless we're baptized, we don't have that uh, awareness that it's a symbolic act whereby our, it's an outward expression of an inward work of faith that God has done in our heart. And the, the covering of a worship cross, now this is something that may be fairly new, uh, and I realize that's a little more toward bar dark blue. Violet or purple are the appropriate colors for uh, the season of Lent, but during, uh, during Lent, during the season of Lent, including Sundays, um, in most churches that observe the tradition of Lent, worship, service, worship crosses are to be uh, covered unless um, uh, they're used in, um, you know, movable and that kind of thing. So you cover them in purple, and I meant to get the other, I've got another covering for a cross to put on the the worship cross that Daniel's congregation made and left it in the office, so I apologize for that. But that's why our worship cross is covered, and uh, all of the candles are lit. This is, uh, this is an eyes wide open service because tomorrow night what we remember with the Lord Jesus Christ on Good Friday is that they were wi eyes wide shut on uh, Good Friday. They were shut to justice, they were shut to goodness, they were shut to mercy, and grace and the Lord was crucified as a consequence of it. So, for our opening scripture, uh, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. And this is the reason that we celebrate communion. Because of the blood of the Lamb, we have the opportunity to understand that our sins have been forgiven. If you will, take your hymnal. And turn to the hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together, number 618. In the uh, hymnal, we'll stand as we sing all the verses together. So will you stand as we sing?
ask you to remain seated for the reading of this word, the correct position of the disciples during the Lord's Supper was actually a reclining position on a very, very low table that was close to the ground. We in the Western tradition have them seated around a table that's 30 inches off the floor, like our dining room table, but uh, they reclined at the meal. Uh, better for your digestion, I understand, uh, but it was the common uh, common thing to recline at meal. Here, the words of the Old Testament lesson, which come to us from Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4, and then 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I call upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. And may God add the blessing of understanding to the reading of his word. We'll now have a special presentation of music.
this is part of what Holy Week means to me is not only being challenged by the Word of God, but to hear special music like that. The New Testament lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, the 22nd chapter. This is Luke's recount of the events that we celebrate tonight, and it's found at Luke 22, verses 14 to 23. And there we find these words, When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve disciples with him, the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. And again, may God add the blessing of understanding to the reading of his word. Camille is going to present the Via Dolorosa for us at this time.
thank you, Camille. Now tonight we, we receive the Lord's Supper, much as they did, in the available light. Tomorrow night when we gather in this sanctuary for the Tenebrae service, we will gradually extinguish all the lights and leave it uh, in the darkness of the tomb. And then Sunday morning we'll gather in here for service of light and celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now just briefly, we're, we're almost too busy for Easter, aren't we? It's uh, kind of a sad thing. There, there's so much going on, but this, and this ought to be, this ought to be the very highest week for all of us. I, I'm usually exhausted by the end of Holy Week, but it's a good exhaustion because uh, at least we have offered, even though not all have taken up the offer, we have offered the opportunity for people to be in worship. And I think that tonight is one of those very, very significant nights when uh, churches ought to be made available to the faithful to come and participate uh, in the Lord's Supper. And when we come to the Lord's Supper, there, there are all kinds of things. We, we observe two sacraments in the United Methodist Church. We observe the sacrament of baptism, which we have celebrated uh, recently with the infant baptism, uh, young adult baptism. Uh, and then we observe the sacrament of, of communion, ho Holy Communion, the Eucharist. And uh, a sacrament means a gift graciously given that the Lord gave to the church. And there are five doctrines that are covered in the service of the Eucharist. And I, I lift these for you, lift these up to you uh, just briefly. And, and I think that when you, when you hear them and understand uh, that what God has given to us, He's given us, first of all, the doctrine of the Incarnation. This is God made flesh. And Jesus wants us to understand the physicality of what we're doing tonight. Uh, over and over, it is recounted to us. Uh, Jesus said, this is my body. This is my body broken for you. This is a body that can be broken. This is not the substance that the Father is made of. This is not the substance that the Holy Spirit is made of. This is God made flesh. This is a body that can be beaten. This is a body that can be whipped. This is a body that can be slapped. This is a body upon which a crown of thorns can be placed. And he will bleed. Because this is the doctrine of the incarnation. There is secondly the doctrine of the atonement. We realize that because of this offering, that two warring substances have, have, been, have the opportunity to come together and be at peace with one another. We, we read how the angels sang uh, peace on earth when Jesus was born. And yet at the day of the triumphal entry, we hear the words peace in heaven. Listen, this was the sacrifice that would put at peace a world that was at war with its creator because of sin. There is the doctrine of faith. Jesus said to the disciples and those who were gathered following him one day, and, and from this point on, many turned away. But listen to what he said. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is John, the sixth chapter. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. Except you eat of this flesh. And drink of this blood. There is, there is fourthly the doctrine of the communion of saints. The Apostle Paul said, Is this not the common cup that we share together? It's something that we do as a church. It's something that we do as a body. It's something that we do with every other believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it is the doctrine of the advent. It's important for us to understand that this meal has contained in it the promise of a second advent. We came through that season of the year with the chrismon tree decorating our sanctuary and the, uh, and the beautiful sanctuary direct decorations that we do in this church. And that was to celebrate and remember the first advent. But there is a second. And this meal contains in it the doctrine 
of the second advent. Now, there are four things that I want to lift up to you about the Eucharistic service itself. It was designed for these four things. And I want to make this statement to you. I read this statement one time by a theologian that just blew me away because of its simplicity. Isn't it so often that we, we, we experience the simple and the common so much that, that the profundity we may miss sometimes? But listen to this statement. Eating and drinking are the most significant physical acts in life. Isn't that the truth? Eating and drinking, the two most significant physical acts of life. They are the foundation of life. You can't live without eating and drinking. And Jesus takes the two most significant physical acts in life and combines them and gives them to us in an action that we are to observe that helps us to understand that the taking of him into us and the taking of his truth into our spirits is analogous to the physical act of eating and drinking and just as physical life cannot be sustained without your daily meals. Our spiritual lives cannot be maintained without participating in this act of eating and drinking of the symbols of his blood. Secondly, it is a visible. Listen, some people have called the Eucharist a visible sermon. A visible sermon. It is a visible seal of a new covenant. You know, when we were kids, I guess growing up in the days of, it may not be politically correct now, but cowboys and Indians, you know, uh, Westerns were big on TV. We all remember Dale Evans and Roy Rogers and Trigger and the Rifle Man, they show Rifle Man replays now on TV, and every now and then I watch them just to remember what it was like to watch TV in black and white. And we always wanted to, somehow there always got to be this thing with Native Americans and the Blood Covenant thing. Now, one of my favorite movies, I, I hate to admit this to you because you, immediately you're, I think you're going to probably put me into a certain genre. Don't, don't do that, and, and I can't recommend movies because there's so much bad language now that if I say I like one, then you can say, ooh, there's a lot of bad language in that. Well, uh, The Outlaw Josie Wales <laughs> is one of my favorite movies, but there is a scene, y'all, that's a very significant scene. Um, the character Josie is about to make peace where he's settling out in the Nevada Bluff somewhere and out west, and, and the, the Indian Ten Bears, who was a historical uh, figure, uh, is going to make peace with Josie. Uh, they, Josie has ridden up to his camp and in his blazing pistols they're either going to both die or they're going to both live that's just the short end of it and so they each take a knife and they cut their hands and they grab each other's hand and you see the blood, blood has co-mingled now when we were kids we always liked the idea of a blood covenant but nobody wanted to be the first to cut their finger see to share that blood I mean paper cuts fierce enough you know Jesus said this is my blood shed for you this is the blood this is a blood covenant a blood covenant it's designed thirdly as a memorial You know, when we see a memorial, I, I remember being on a camping trip to the far north with a man who was a, I respected as a Sunday school teacher in the church, one of my youth counselors. We had this long discussion. He's born and bred in Georgia. And I asked him, he was, the, he was the lawyer in Houston County for the Houston County School Board, significant man in, in the community. 
And I remember us having this long discussion on a camping trip. And I said, Tom, you know, in the north, you don't see as many statues to the Union dead as you see in the south. And we had just moved to Perry in 74, 75, and so on. And I'd been through a lot of small towns in Georgia. And it seemed like just about every town of any size had a memorial to the Confederate dead, to our Confederate dead. Men who saw darkness falling around them could act as though they saw the dawn of a new day. That's the quote at Stone Mountain. And I said, we don't, we don't see, I didn't see that as much up north when I was growing up. And he said, well, there's a different understanding in the South about the war between the states. You see, for many in the South, they felt like they were defending their homes and their land. In many ways, it was an invasion. In the North, it was service to the federal government. And that made sense to me. Now, regardless of all the other historical aspects of the war between the states, and there are many, there are many, but when I see a memorial, I, I consciously, because I'm a student of history, I stop and think, why was that put up? What, what were the makers thinking? Who did they want to honor? And I love that scene at the end of Saving Private Ryan, where the private has gone back over to the beach above Normandy, where several thousand of our dead are buried who served this country, and who were there on D-Day. And he remembers the men who gave their lives so that he could return home to his parents who had already lost his brothers in battle. And he turns to his wife. He said, am I a good man? Am I a good man? Am I worthy? of what was done and sacrificed for me. And you see, we're to remember that there was one who loved us and gave himself for us so that we could live for him. Ask yourself when it's your time to kneel at this altar tonight, am I worthy? what he did for me. And you see, he's the one that makes us worthy. Then the fourth thing, this service is designed to be prophetic, and we close our meditation with that. I love reunions, family reunions. We don't, we don't do homecomings like we used to. Maybe it's time for us to plan another one in this church. There's nothing like a reunion. And sometimes we use funerals. Sometimes we use weddings as reunions. And Jesus made those statements in the service, in, in, this, in this action that we observe in our service. Until that day. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you. Now, you see, if there's not prophecy there, you're missing the main point. There's a promise of the good yet to come, the best yet to behold. Until that day, I drink it new with you. So these four things are built into this service. Eating and drinking are the most significant physical acts of our lives. It's a visible sign covenant relationship. It's designed as a memorial. And finally, it is designed to be prophetic. Now, if you will, take your hymnal. Turn with me to page 15. I'm sorry, turn, turn back to 12. Now, I will explain to you, and we have done this service before, on the altar, there are uh, communion wafers. There is one cup 
I, I just appreciate deeply the common cup. Now, you will take the wafer and dip it into cup, to the cup so that you're receiving communion in both kinds. So take the wafer, uh, dip it into the cup. But I do like the common cup. I really do. Now, it's not so popular to drink from a common cup. We're all worried about those things. Jesus wasn't worried about the things that we're worried about because he, he passed the cup to the 12. And you say, well, we've got 10 times that many here. Well, maybe we do. But still, it is the common cup into which we dip the wafer. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now, use this as a time to greet one another and to hug each other's necks and say, I'm glad that you're here at Monday Thursday Communion. Will you do that quickly? So if you will, take your hymnal and join me again in the great, at the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
This is the body. Represents the body of Christ, which was broken for you. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we remember tonight, we need to remember the brokenness. We need to remember that you were willing. We need to remember that we ought to love because you have love. In Jesus' name. This is represents the blood of Christ. The cup, which is the common cup. There are no, there's no mistaking, you know, this fact hits me every now and then. There's no mistaking around the world. When you see a cup, when you see bread together, you know it means the communion of the saints. You know that it means holy communion. And you know that you are part of that fellowship. Lord, I receive into myself that which you have to give me. I receive you and your truth in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as you come to the table tonight, I want you to come with those that you came with. Uh, I will be serving everyone who comes. There's no order to it. Uh, you may sit in your seat and pray. You may come to this altar and pray. Uh, if you choose to leave an offering at this altar, now the next couple of altar offerings, uh, minus what we give to FaithWorks every month out of, our, out of our communion fund, we had two break-ins this past week. They, and they may have been combined on the same night. I don't know that we know that for sure. But um, they took the new staff computer out of my office, broke my office window and took it out. And then uh, this was the one that Lisa Jenkins was using and had given to Cameron to use for the music ministry. And then we had just given a, a, a new air compressor to the bicycle ministry. Those guys were pumping up bike tires by hand. And I used to do that when I was a kid. I wouldn't do that again now if you paid me. We had bought a compressor to give to the bike ministry and that got stolen. The new box is sitting over there in the garage. But they broke a the window out and got in and got that. So I'm gonna replace those pieces of equipment. Our deductible is $500. And uh, so the insurance isn't going to pay anything on that. We filed police reports on everything. But uh, So the offerings that you may leave tonight until we can replace this equipment that's been stolen, that's what we're going to use it for uh, the next couple. And then in June, just to give you a little look ahead, we're going to offer some scholarships for some children in our church to go to Epworth to camp. So just come as the Lord leads you. Uh, come and deal at this altar. Uh, I will serve you communion when you have finished receiving. And when you have prayed the extent of the prayer that you would like to pray at this altar, then feel free to dismiss yourself from this sanctuary. And if you will, just save your fellowship until you get outside of the sanctuary, okay? So just come as you may.